to Massachusetts and the Boston area, but right throughout the United States for his wonderful book, Exposing the Council on Foreign Relations. It's probably been the bestseller for the John Birch Society for many, many years and probably will continue to be in the future. Uh, all of you know him. Uh, many of you know him here personally. Uh, we're just so grateful for the wonderful uh, publication he put together. It's helped us mightily in explaining the nature of many of the problems in America. Would you please welcome the author of uh, Shadows of Power, Mr. Jim Perlow. Hold the mic right like you're on your chin. Otherwise, it won't provide any to the communications for you. Okay. And then, then you need to have the air conditioner on us. Uh, All right. So you're heard. Thank well, you very uh, much. first, I'm going to try an experiment. Uh, if I speak without the mic, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. I think I'll try it without the mic. Well, uh, uh, I did write the Shadow of Power, and I am on the uh, John. Bird Society Speakers Bureau, and I usually talk either about the shadows of power in the Council on Foreign Relations of the World Government. I also talk about um, a couple of, uh, I've written a couple of books. Uh, some of you may know I've written books on uh, creation versus evolution, uh, case against Darwin and tornado in the junkyard, and I also give uh, talks on those topics. And uh, they last about 90 minutes, and I used PowerPoint, and I figured it wasn't going to be appropriate for tonight to try and delve into that. So I asked Hal Shirtleff, Hal, what do, you think I, what do you think I had to talk about tonight? He said, well, Jim, you write a lot for the New American. Uh, why don't you pick a topic like the Tenth Amendment movement? And I said, well, I have been writing a lot for the, the New American. I've uh, written articles on Iran and Transatlantic Partnership, and got the, the next issue of the New American I'll have articles on the fall of China in the 40s, and one on CFR domination of the Obama administration. But I figured. You guys um, read those anyway, probably, and so it's pretty redundant, and I don't know how people feel about hearing four serious speeches in one night. So I decided tonight I'd try something absolutely, totally different. Uh, tonight, I decided I'd do the first ever, and if Mr. Thompson and the uh, council don't like it, it'll be the last ever. <laughs> John Birch Society stand-up comedy routine. <laughs> Some people might be thinking, well, Jim, how can you do comedy uh, when things are very serious uh, and the economy is so bad? You know, the economy is bad. In fact, it's so bad, the other day, I saw an illegal immigrant trying to deport himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad, and the cost of fuel is so high. Uh, last week, a plane was on the way over from the EU to America, and they actually had to underfuel this plane. And uh, so they had to throw all the luggage overboard to the chagrin of the passengers, but then the captain came on with worse news, and he said, Folks, I'm going to have to ask three of you to make the supreme sacrifice and jump out. I think it's the only way we can make the plane light enough to make, float, make it to land. Well, they say that patriotism is dead in the EU, but that's really not true. A very patriotic Englishman stood up and he said, God save the Queen, and he jumped out of the plane. And then a very patriotic Frenchman stood up and he said, Viva la France, and he jumped out of the plane. And the pilot came on and he said, Folks, we need just one more person to jump out, and I think the rest of the passengers can make it. So an American stood up and he said, remember the Alamo, and he pushed a Mexican out of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Patriotism is not dead in the European Union. Uh, people still maintain their national identities. In fact, uh, as proof of that, uh, recently over in the British Isles, three men walked into a pub, and there was an uh, Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman, and they each ordered a beer, and this pub was full of flies, and each man found that there was a fly in his beer. So how did they react? The Englishman went, mm, pushed his beer away, wouldn't have anything to do with it. The Irishman put his hand right into the beer, grabbed the fly, flicked it away, and drank down his beer as if nothing had happened. Ah, but the Scotsman, the Scotsman very carefully picked the fly out of his beer, held it over the mug, and said, Spit it out, you wee rascal! <laughs> <laughs> now, 
some people are probably thinking, you know what, Jim, these are just warmed over ethnic jokes that have nothing to do with the John Birch Society. We want to hear jokes about communism and socialism. Well, you know, the, the guy who did the best jokes about communism was really somebody who knew about it, Yakov Smirnov. He was the Russian comedian, came over here in the 80s, you might remember him, he'd be on TV, and say stuff like this, America's great, you can always find a party. In Russia, the party always finds you. <laughs> Another thing he said was, America's great, you have so many TV stations here. You know, over in Russia we have only two TV stations. Channel 1 is all communist propaganda. Channel 2 is KGB officer telling you, turn back to Channel 1! <laughs> Smirnov said it's very tough to be a comedian in Russia because you had to submit all your jokes to the uh, Bureau of uh, Jokes in the government, which is pretty rough. But he also said it was very difficult to handle hecklers in the Soviet Union when you're telling jokes. He said, over here in America, if somebody heckled you telling telling a joke, you could just say, ah, your mother wears army boots. He says, the problem with saying that in Russia is the guy's mother probably did wear army boots. <laughs> but jokes about communism go back a long ways. You know, back in the days of Stalin, Stalin, they say, wanted to uh, find out what the Russian people really thought of him. And he hadn't liquidated anybody for about a week, and he was looking for somebody to do it in junk. <laughs> so Stalin went into a Russian factory disguised as an ordinary laborer. You know, he had fake glasses and a phony nose. He went up to one of the workers and he said, So tell me, comrade, what do you think of Comrade Stalin? And the worker started trembling because all these other workers were around. He said, What do I think of Comrade Stalin? Uh, tell you what, comrade, uh, let me meet you tonight outside factory. I will tell you what I think. So that night, Stalin, still in disguise, met the uh, factory worker in the woods outside the factory. And he said, So, comrade, are you ready to tell me now what you think of Comrade Stalin? And the worker looked around, still in trepidation, when he was absolutely sure that no one was looking, he said, I like him. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, unfortunately, I, I think uh, many of you in the Burn Society would agree with me that our own American bureaucracy is beginning to rival that of the Soviet Union. In fact, a few years ago, NASA was sending up the astronauts, and they made the horrible discovery that the ballpoint pens our astronauts were using would not work in zero gravity conditions. So NASA spent 10 years and 120 million dollars of the taxpayers' money to develop a ballpoint pen that would write under zero gravity conditions. The Russians, on the other hand, used a pencil. <laughs> There's always been great rivalry between our two countries. In fact, a few years ago, the KGB and the CIA were having a big argument about who had the most effective intelligence service. And they decided to have a contest. And here's what they did. They released a rabbit into a forest, and whoever could find the rabbit first, that would prove they had the best intelligence. The CIA went in first, and they hired informants throughout the forest, and they set up surveillance equipment throughout the forest, but after three weeks, the CIA could not turn up the rabbit. Then the KGB went in, and after just two hours, they came back out with a beaten up bear. And the bear was saying, I admit it, I'm a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> People in the USSR always resented our suggesting that there was no freedom of speech over there. In fact, I got into an argument with a Russian about this back during the Reagan years, and they said to him, look, we have freedom of speech here in America. Here in America, you can stand right in front of the White House, say, down with Reagan, and nothing will happen to you. And the Russians said, same thing in Russia, in Moscow, you can stand right in Red Square, in front of Kremlin, and say, down with Reagan, nothing will happen to you either. <laughs> Speaking of down with jokes, I don't know if you heard this, but uh, uh, during World War II on the island of Iwo Jima, the Marines were having a rough time getting this very tough Japanese soldier out of a cave. And the sergeant of the platoon got a very brilliant idea. He went to the best sharpshooter on the platoon, and he said, Tex, I want you to go down there, and I want you to go to the mouth of the cave and yell, down with the emperor. Now you know how prideful these Japanese are. The guy will come right out of there and you can plug him. So the sharpshooter goes down to the mouth of the cave. He says, down with the emperor. And just as the sergeant predicted, out marches the Japanese soldier in a huff. And he says, no, down with Roosevelt. And he walks back into the cave. The sergeant's really upset. He goes up to the sharpshooter and he says, Tex, Tex, what happened? Why didn't you plug the guy? The, the sharpshooter says, I'm sorry, Sergeant, 
but I just could not bring myself to shoot it, fellow Republican. <laughs> <laughs> now, some people might be thinking, you know, Jim, these jokes are stale, World War II and Stalin. Have you got anything up to date? We want to hear about CFR dominating the White House today, you know, recent, some of recent, you know. Well, um, it's true that um, uh, we need to do that. So. Uh, Let's take uh, the Bush administration. The Bush administration was dominated by the CFR, of course, and a lot of people felt that it was really Dick Cheney, the CFR man, who was one of the show, and that George Bush was just a front man for the public's benefit. And there's a story that one day Bush and Cheney were in the Oval Office, and Bush was very morose, and he was saying, gee, Dick, you know, uh, the polls show my popularity is at an all-time low, and the people think that I'm stupid and that you're the smart one. And Cheney says, uh, don't worry about it, George. You aren't stupid. The American people are stupid. In fact, I'm going to show you just how stupid the American people are. So Cheney takes Bush out of the sidewalk in front of the White House, and he hails a taxi cab. And he leans into the taxi cab, and he says to the driver, Listen, buddy, I live over on 14 Illinois Avenue. I want you to drive over there right now and see if I'm home or not. So very dutifully, the taxi cab driver says, OK, sir, and drives off. So Cheney says to Bush, George, you see that? See how stupid that guy was? Bush says, you're right, Dick, the guy was stupid. There's a payphone there. He could have called the CFR. <laughs> Another time, Bush was over visiting the Queen of England, having tea with her, and he said, Your Majesty, what is the secret of having effective government? And the Queen said, Mr. Bush, the secret of effective government is to surround yourself with intelligent people. I will demonstrate. And the Queen tinkled a little bell. Immediately, Tony Blair walked in. And the Queen said, Mr. Blair, I have a question for you. Your parents have a child. It's not your brother, and it's not your sister. Who is it? And Blair said, why, that would be me, Mom. And the Queen said, yes, correct, Mr. Blair. You may leave us now. So the Queen said to the President, so you see, Mr. Bush, if you want to have an effective government, you must surround yourself with people who can answer questions like that. So Bush came back, and he's sitting in the Oval Office with Dick Cheney. He says, you know, Dick, I'm going to find out if my guys are smart or not. So he pushes a buzzer, and Carl Rove comes in. And Bush says, uh, listen, Rove, uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, let me see if I got this straight. Um, your parents have a child. It's not your brother, and it's not your sister. So who is it? So Rove thinks to himself for a moment. He says, why, that would be me, Mr. President. And Bush says, no, 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 you idiot. It would be Tony Blair. <laughs> Oh, come on, Jim. You know, even, even Bush jokes are, are old hat now. Have you got something related to the Ron Paul campaign? Yeah, I do. Ron Paul, rightfully, very popular this year. In fact, he's so popular that this year he was invited to throw out the opening pitch at a Washington Nationals baseball game. Well, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, got wind of this, and she was incensed because she knew what Ron Paul's politics were like. And so she used her influence to get a seat right next to Ron Paul, where she could share or even hog the limelight. Well, after the national anthem had played, Ron Paul stood up, took Hillary by the collar, took her and threw her over the railing right onto the baseball field. At that point, the umpire rushed up to the stands and said, Mr. Paul, I think you misunderstood. You were supposed to throw out the pitch. The pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Paul is from Texas, and we have uh, Texans and Oklahomans here today. And, uh, uh, Texans are, are pretty pretty tough. In fact, you know, this is true. When I worked at uh, Birch Society headquarters when they were in, in Belmont, Mass., uh, we used to have joked that, uh, you know, we needed Massachusetts some of these tough Texas Birchers up here. You know, they would straighten out the state. Well, I don't know if you guys knew this. There's a show on TV called Survivor. They have now come up with one in Texas. It's called Survivor Texas Style. I'm going to read to you the flyer for this show. The contestants will all start in Dallas, then drive to Waco, Austin, San Antonio, over to Houston, and down to Brownsville. They'll then proceed up to Del Rio, El Paso, Midland, Odessa, Lubbock, and Amarillo. From there, they'll go on to Abilene, Fort Worth, and finally back to Dallas. Now, here's the rules. Each contestant must drive a pink, foreign-made automobile <laughs> with the following bumper stickers. <laughs> Proud to be gay. <laughs> I voted for Obama. <laughs> Confiscate all guns. Three cheers for the NAFTA superhighway. <laughs> Hillary in 2012. 
country music stinks <laughs> and boycott beef. <laughs> the first one to make it back to Dallas alive wins. <laughs> They're still tough down in Texas, you know, they haven't stopped being tough in Texas. In fact, uh, just last month, uh, there was a, a gay man who walked into a Texas bar and went up to the bartender and he said, um, give me a margarita. And he was walking around the bar and he said to one of the tall Texans, say, big boy, why don't you and me meet later on? This guy's walking around acting out the gay lifestyle because this is 2009 and everybody's politically correct today, even in Texas. Then he hears a big thud, a noise coming from the back room. So he goes over to the back room and opens the door and sees a group of men standing there. He says, what are you boys doing back here? One of the Texans says, we're a hanging queers. <laughs> <laughs> the gay guy says, well, in that case, I think I'll be the <laughs> That's very politically incorrect, and it's very hard to be uh, politically incorrect these days. In fact, you might have heard about the little girl in public school, just seven years old, who was uh, being taught by her teacher about whales. And the teacher was saying that uh, a whale could not possibly swallow a human being because even though it's a large mammal, it has a very small throat. Now, the girl was a Christian girl, and she said, but teacher, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Well, this teacher was a real NEA type, like the type that uh, Sam Blumenfeld was talking about, atheist, left-wing. He said, the Bible is completely wrong about that. So the little girl said, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. And the teacher said, what if Jonah went to hell? The teacher said, and the little girl said, then you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing on our religious theme, I don't know if you guys heard that the uh, state of Massachusetts, due to environmental regulation, has become overrun with squirrels, but out, out in uh, Western Mass, a small town, all three of its churches got infested with squirrels. <coughs> and the question was, what are they going to do about these squirrels? Well, the first church decided they couldn't do anything. They said, hey, you know, squirrels are God's creation, and if they're in our church, it must be his will. Second church decided to be a little more proactive, but very humane. They captured the squirrels in cages and took them out to the outskirts of town and released them. But after two weeks, the squirrels had come back. Only the third church was effective at handling the squirrels. This is what they did. They baptized the squirrels and enrolled them as members. Now, they only see them on Christmas and Easter. I don't know if you heard about the atheist at the Harvard professor. This atheist was uh, backpacking out in the Massachusetts woods, and he was uh, looking around and uh, admiring all the beauty around him. And he said, look at that waterfall, and look at those beautiful flowers and that sunset. Isn't it amazing what the Big Bang and evolution and pure chance have created? Well, that moment, a big bear raced out from behind some trees, pounced on the atheist, held it down with its paws, and snarled its teeth. And the atheist said, oh, Lord, help me. At that moment, there was a clap of thunder, and a voice from up above said, all these years you've denied that I exist. So my understanding that you now wish to become a believer? Well, even though the atheist life was at stake, this is still too much for his pride to accept. He said, no, I don't want to become a believer, but uh, I'd appreciate it if you made the bear a believer. <laughs> <laughs> so the voice said, done. And then the bear got on its knees and folded its paws together in prayer and said, Lord, I thank thee for the bounty I am now about to receive. <laughs> The biggest contributor to atheism, uh, I think, in Western civilization was Charles Darwin, and I say that with a little bit of authority because I've written two books about it. Uh, and as you know, uh, Darwin said that men were not made in the image of God, that men had evolved from apes or ape-like creatures. And uh, one thing you may not know, though, is that Darwin tried to do an experiment one day. He put a baboon on a leash, and he took it to one of the poshest restaurants in all of London. And the maitre d' rushed up and he said, Sir, sir, you can't bring that vile, disgusting beast in here. And Darwin said, My good man, I'll let you know that apes and humans are very close relatives. And the maitre d' said, I was talking to the ape. <laughs> <laughs> no, they say, they say you can't do jokes about science because it's not funny. I don't know if that's true. You know, here in Massachusetts, we have uh, uh, quite a few college towns and uh, Recently out in the town of Amherst, a physics professor walked into a bar and he ordered a drink. And he also ordered a cocktail for the empty stool next to him. 
And he started talking to the stool as if there was a beautiful blonde there. He's saying, may I buy you another, my dear? Would you like to go out tonight? Well, the bartender was looking at this with some curiosity, but he said, uh, well, you know, to call this town, lots of wacky props in this town. He was kind of used to it. But this kept happening every night. The professor would come in and order a cocktail for the empty seat next to him and start talking as if there was a beautiful blonde there. Finally, the bartender's curiosity got the best of him, and he said, hey, uh, professor, uh, pardon me for butting in, but how come every night you, uh, you order a drink for the empty space next to you and start talking to it? And the professor said, my good man, all of you know that according to quantum physics, there is no such thing as empty space. Particles are constantly appearing and disappearing in space. And it's actually possible if the correct wave function collapses, the right molecules could come together and a beautiful blonde could instantly appear before our eyes. So the bartender said, well, Professor, you know what? I don't know nothing about science, but uh, this is what I'm wanting to tell you. You know, every Friday night, we got ladies' night here at the bar. You know, some pretty nice looking ladies come in here on Friday night. So listen, Professor, why don't you come in here on a Friday night and talk to some of the real girls and ask them out. Who knows? Hey, hey, hey. Maybe get lucky and one of them would say yes. And the professor said, oh, come on, my good man. What are the chances of that happening? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to do uh, just two more jokes. <laughs> a redneck joke and a blonde joke. Now, the reason I'm going to do the redneck joke is that uh, I've been paying a lot of compliments to, uh, to uh, Texans in this, in this um, and Southerners in this, uh, this uh, collection of jokes, and uh, I figure some of our New England natives might resent that, so we'll have to have one redneck joke just for balance. And the reason I'm going to do a blonde joke, uh, with apologies to our blondes here, is because uh, in the Birch Society we're all supposed to be male chauvinist pigs. All right, well, it seems that there were these three rednecks down in Tennessee, and they were going home one night, and they were dead drunk. It was the middle of the night, and they decided to take a shortcut through the local graveyard. And one of them stumbled over a gravestone, and he uh, pulled out a match, and he read it, and he said, Well, look here, fellas. This gravestone belonged to Bubba Smith from Nashville. He lived to a ripe old age of 88. Next redneck also stumbles over a gravestone, and he lights his lighter, and he reads it, and he says, Oh, shucks, I got your beat. This here fella was uh, Ralph Jones from the town of Franklin, and uh, he lived to be uh, 95. The third redneck also stumbles over a stone marker. He says, oh, I got you both beat. This here fellow lived to be 150. The other two rednecks say, 150? What was his name? And the redneck reads the stone very carefully. He says, Miles from uh, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, our, our blonde joke. Now, let's talk about these FEMA concentration camps. And there's uh, a lot of controversy uh, about that. Some people in the Birch Society say there's no such thing. It's just, hey, it's, uh, you know, tucked away with the uh, black helicopters. It's just rubbish. And other people take it pretty seriously and say when the New World Order comes, they're going to stick us in these concentration camps. Well, there is actually a blonde joke in connection with this. Since the New World Order comes, and three girls are assigned to a FEMA concentration camp for girls. A blonde, a brunette, and a redhead. Now the redhead and the brunette are plotting an escape. And the blonde overhears, and she wants to come along. And the redhead, who's kind of bad-tempered, says, Listen, blondie, you can come along with us. But if you do anything to louse up this escape, I'll break every bone in your body. And the blonde says, Don't worry. Don't worry. So finally the night comes they've been waiting for. It's a very dark night, very cloudy. And the brunette and the redhead use a pair of homemade wire clippers to cut through the barbed wire. Then the three girls race out and make their escape. But then the lights flash, the sirens sound. They've been spotted. The girls race into the woods, but the guards are catching up with them with their dogs. And they can hear the dogs barking, getting louder and louder. So the redhead says, come on, girls, up into the trees. So each girl climbs up into a tree. The guards and the dogs stop at the tree where the brunette is. And the dogs are sniffing around at the foot of the tree. And the brunette goes, woo-hoo, woo-hoo. The guards say, ah, never mind, there's nothing up in that tree but an old hoodie owl. Come on, come on, let's keep going. So the dogs then stop at the tree where the redhead is. The redhead goes, caw, 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 caw. The guards say, ah, you dumb mutts, there's nothing up in that tree but an old crow. Come on, come on, keep moving. So they move along a little further, and they stop at the tree where the blonde is. The dogs are starting to yip and yap, and they're 
shining their flashlights up at the branches and the blonde is thinking to herself and finally she smiles and she says, <laughs> that completes uh, what made me our last ever John Birch say. <laughs> I, I just want to mention one thing, by the way. I realize that uh, jokes are very individual, and sometimes uh, it can be hurtful, and if uh, I did say anything that offended anyone tonight, I do apologize, but I thank you for putting up with me. Thanks very much. <laughs>